Good morning, everybody. I think we are ready to start. Uh, welcome to this side event convened at the crack of dawn. I hope you had enough time to wash your hands in these days of coronavirus. Uh, uh, today's discussion will be about social norms and rituals, individual and collective self-regulation strategies in cannabis use. Use because not only we have never endorsed the UN definition of abuse, even if you just use, but use despite the fact that everything, at least in Europe, because we will hear mainly from uh, European experiences also with uh, some insight on other parts of the world, despite the fact that perhaps legislations at the national level have been relaxed, nothing has been legalized. Production, consumption, commerce remains prohibited. Uh, then there a series of uh, national courts have also started to open a discussion on the, of the proportionality of penalties, but nothing from the political powers, meaning parliaments or government, has been changed over the last few years. Uh, at the same time, people alone or in groups, organized or non-organized, uh, uh, structured or non-structured, have found ways to try and uh, self-regulate the way in which they not only consume, but they also uh, get the, 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 the herb, the stuff that they use. And it has proved to be quite not only effective, but safe. And I think it's very good to try and project the image of a group of people, a large group of people, if I were to talk about my country, Italy, apparently. According to the government estimates, 6 million people out of a population of 60 million people use cannabis more or less regularly every year. So it's a lot of people. And despite the fact that it's not legal, even if now some <laughs> laws have been changed, uh, people have to get it on the street, and you don't know what you're uh, getting, you don't know what you're smoking, but you may know, if you're good enough, what you may be growing. And the Italian um, uh, Court of Cassation has recently adopted a sentence in which they say that if the growing is for medical purposes, and it's a reasonable amount of plants, it can be done. It's a very vague description of what can be done. Of course, there's no intention as of today in March 2020 to regulate uh, uh, home production, but it's an example of how, where laws and policies don't allow, on the one hand, citizens, and on the other, uh, courts and tribunals have been uh, pushing for that. We will hear from Susanna Ronconi, who's from uh, Forum Droge, which uh, will speak of uh, the role in promoting cannabis control uses and informal special norms. Susanna has been uh, has published more, uh, very recently a research uh, in Italian. I don't know if there's an English version also mm -hmm. of the study. So far, only in Italian. We have been uh, working together also in trying to disperse the, the results of this research in Italy. And again, uh, the problem is not only that the, the leg uh, institutions are not listening, but the media do not pick up the most important part of the story. They like the scary part, but they don't like the positive part. And this is something that I think has to be taken into consideration for the future work of drug policy reformers. Mm -hmm. Unless we educate the media, we will never be able to have an impact on the general population, but also on decision makers. After her, uh, we will hear from Constanza Sanchez Aviles from ICERS. She will speak about the role of municipalities in promoting, no, no, this is Tom, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's too early for me, yeah. There's no title then. Oh, that's she, you are the Cannabis Social Club, which uh, has been at the center of a lot of discussions and practice in Spain, and in particular in Catalonia. And you will hear also they have not only had a lot of problems in generating those um, uh, clubs, but also the relationship vis-a-vis -vis the law and the loopholes in the law that have uh, allowed these things to happen. Uh, Costanza comes from Spain, and Tom Blickman from the Translational Institute that everybody knows. They also have a, a, a study that is available at the end of the table in English and also Spanish. Spanish. Okay. Uh, and he will speak about the role of municipalities in promoting alternative effective cannabis policies. The Netherlands is famous in the world for having been at the forefront 45 years ago of allowing people to smoke in safe environment, but the situation has been more tolerated than legalized, and we hope that in the future we will also hear from the Dutch 
uh, government or parliament, they initiated the legislation a couple of years ago, but it got lost in a series of elections. Um, um, there's also, I will have to leave the room in one minute because unfortunately we have a, another event taking place upstairs, uh, which was rescheduled last week, so I apologize for that. Um, one final word, and then perhaps Lorenzo, who's also from the Associazione Luca Coscioni, as myself, and Science for Democracy, will speak about an idea that we are working on, which is a European Citizens Initiative to harmonize the cannabis penalties around Europe, which would be another way of uh, um, talking about regulations, but from an institutional viewpoint. Because this is about self-regulation, you will self-regulate your time, and you are speaking uh, opportunities and I'm sure that someone will also take care of the questions. Apologies once again and enjoy the rest of the panel. Ciao. Okay. Thank you, Marco. No, this is not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so how hi to everyone. We are happy to, to talk with you about uh, these issues. Um, we are uh, talking, uh, we are discussing all over the world about uh, alternative uh, cannabis policies and we are very focused on the legal regulation of uh, production and the supply, but we think that it's very interesting too to talk about uh, which are the implications of uh, this uh, alternative uh, policy on the side of the demand regulation policy, I mean on the, on the uh, use of uh, uh, cannabis. Uh, and I, I want to um, propose a, a specific perspective uh, dealing with the social learning and self-regulation strategies in cannabis use. Uh, we know, and many qualitative research told, uh, told that, uh, that uh, uh, prohibition hinders and the limits, uh, the uh, possibility to uh, create, share, and disseminate uh, informal social norms about uh, cannabis use, why, uh, while a legalization uh, system frees and empowers this natural social process. Uh, so it's interesting uh, considering the uh, possibility to thanks to alternative cannabis policy, to shift towards policies, policies that uh, valorize and uh, uh, support, instead of weaken, uh, personal and social strategies of control and functional use of cannabis. I draw a parallel with alcohol, even if we know that the, 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 the two systems are different because of legal status of the substances, but it's interesting uh, for me to, um, to suggest you to consider what happened in the so-called Mediterranean model of alcohol use. Uh, the, the Mediterranean model of alcohol use is based on uh, uh, a wide socialization process and the learning social process, and it is based on uh, common and shared uh, informal norms uh, to uh, promote a safer use of alcohol. And it is interesting that uh, uh, in this kind of uh, model is not so important uh, prevalence. I mean, it's not so important the number of people who use alcohol, but it's very important the safer and regulated models of use. If you think of Italy, uh, in Italy uh, we have a high prevalence of alcohol using but uh, uh, we have uh, not, not uh, a very uh, dramatic and uh, uh, important number of problematic drug or, uh, alcohol uh, use. Uh, so um, this model is perhaps inspiring also for cannabis. We know that cannabis <coughs> is uh, illegal now. Uh, in uh, all over the world, uh, part of some states, but cannabis use is very normalized. Uh, and uh, uh, normalization means not only millions of people who use cannabis, it's, it's, normalization is not only a quantitative 
uh, issues. But uh, first of all, it means that there is a culture of, of the use and that there are uh, informal norms and rituals, and that this kind of use is deeply rooted in daily, daily life uh, of people. And there is a, a, a wide learning process about uh, functional and controlled uh, use. Uh, so I think that it's very important that we make much more research about this self-regulation strategy. Here you see some names that I think is very familiar to, uh, to all of us. And uh, these are the researchers that uh, uh, went out of the so-called research tunnel. This is uh, a Tom Decourt definition. Uh, uh, he means that the, the fact that usually the mainstream research, a uh, research on small minorities of people uh, who are the people who use in a problematic way and uh, uh, usually ignore the, the, the most part of people who use in a regulate way. So since the 70s, there are many studies on controls that natural applied by user on the drug use. And the focus, uh, the perspective is a user perspective, focused on competencies and uh, resource of the setting. And this kind of uh, research uh, discover that people who use drug learn for their experience and are able to change their behavior, uh, adopt a wide range of, the, of informal mechanism in their daily life to control their use, and uh, adopt norms and rituals uh, where the uh, context, uh, the social context, uh, social cultural context is a crucial factor. So on this line of research, uh, in, uh, we made uh, a qualitative research on uh, mm, uh, collecting uh, life history of uh, cannabis use of some people in Belgium, Italy, and Spain. Uh, we made this in the framework of the NARP, New Approaches in Arm Reduction and Policy and Practice Project coordinated by TNI. You see some, uh, some uh, numbers of this, uh, the, the, the sample. What is interesting is that the people we interviewed had never had the treatment and never had been in prison. Uh, so they are not institutionali institutionalized people. And uh, they have been using cannabis at least for 10 years, so they have a story to tell, you know. And um, the 50 percent of them are members of Cannabis Social Club. This is why we were interested in understanding if that kind of, uh, of uh, group play a role in self-regulating strategies. Um, so we focus on controls, uh, user applied to fit cannabis use into everyday life in their perception of uh, what is control and what is uncontrolled use, because you know we have no standard but is a personal and subjective uh, 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 perception. And uh, we focus on the factors that facilitate or on the contrary inhibit a controlled use and then something about the role of a cannabis social club. Uh, I, I have not the time to, the, to illustrate uh, all the results, but you can uh, visit our website and find the, the report. But I want to stress a couple of things. The first interesting thing is the trajectories of use. We ask our interviews just to draw a lifetime mm, um, of their use, uh, signing the, the high peak, the more intense, uh, the period of more intense use, and the low peak, the period of abstinence, and so on, and ask them to uh, tell us why they change their behavior, uh, the reason why, how, uh, which, which was the strategy and, and the result. So the, there is a very in-depth um, uh, site on, on their stories. Well, it's interesting that the trajectories are all, for everyone, a varying trajectory. We adopted the typologies of a trajectory designed by Peter Cohen in, uh, in his research. 
That is mean that we are very far from the uh, linear trajectory suggested by the addiction model. You know, the addiction model says where you start, the, the use become more intensive, then the use became problematic, and then you are addict. This is the linear model. <coughs> Uh, the, this is not this is not the case of our interviews. They are a varying model uh, trajectory with a, a period of uh, intensive use, uh, followed by the regaining a more moderate moderate use. So people are able to change uh, their, their behavior, and in this the, in the case of this interview, without professional support. So it's a natural. Uh, process. What is important that the, in uh, the life trend uh, um, tends uh, towards a moderate uh, and a more functional use. So it's uh, it's decreasing in in the in the lifeline, you know, and uh, that uh, uh, every step of this line is uh, uh, is uh, accompanied by a process of learning. So they told us that if for each phase uh, of their um, uh, use history, they, they learn something. Mm -hmm. So the, the learning process is continuous, you know, and they became expert users in this way. Uh, it's interesting that, that in this line there is a continuum from uh, uh, high peaks and, uh, and low peaks, and also this is different from the all or nothing perspective of the addiction, the addiction uh, model. It is also interesting that there is no typology of uh, users. I mean, uh, there is no user that are able to self-regulate and some someone else that is that are not able. Everyone is uh, able to do that in different way, but everyone uh, has this capacity. Mm? Just because there is a continuum in this story. Um, briefly, something about the, the control strategy. It's very important to uh, stress the positive aspects of uh, cannabis use. Uh, I mean, in the mainstream research, we, uh, we stress the, the negative and the problematic uh, aspect. This is important to stress the, the desired effect, because if it's clear what is, which is uh, my objective, my objective in using cannabis, I can also know which is the functional use and which is the dysfunctional use, and this is crucial. Uh, life task and societal, uh, societal duties are uh, very important in a control strategy uh, to adapt cannabis use to, uh, to daily life is, uh, is uh, an important strategy for everyone. And also abstinence is not a strategic choice, but is a tactic. Temporary abstinence is a way to regain control after a period of um, high um, level use. Um, yeah, I have to conclude. Another important uh, uh, aspect is quality. They say that uh, quality is more important than quantity. So it's important to be expert enough to know the different qualities of, uh, of cannabis and choose the one who fits to your uh, model of, uh, of use. And in this, there is a very important role of a cannabis social, social club. Um, about the uh, social club, Costanza will talk about this, but I only want to stress that uh, the clubs are important uh, just to know quality, of cannabis, uh, and uh, to, uh, they are important because they create a context uh, with, uh, which is stable, there is uh, no stress and no, no anxiety, and uh, they uh, support the well-being of the users, and this is uh, an important factor of, uh, safe, uh, for safe use. And they um, support also the creation of a social culture of, uh, of uh, cannabis use. 
there are some indicators of control and non-control uh, use. Uh, control, of, of course, personal well-being, being able to, re to reduce consumption when one decided to do it, being aware of the quality, fulfilling social tax, uh, and being able to use in a moderate, uh, functional way. While diminished control uh, in, uh, means bad feelings, uh, use uh, not respecting their social life, uh, and, and uh, so on. Um, so uh, I think that this uh, knowing uh, the self-regulation strategy natural people applies to their use is uh, important and interesting for policies too, and uh, to uh, shift, uh, shift from the risky properties of drugs and uh, the user powerless to a positive role of individual and context resourcing in regulating the use of drug. And it's important that we adopt a normalization <coughs> approach toward the cannabis use and recon know, recognize, and empower social norms, uh, rituals that can uh, support a regulated and controlled use of cannabis. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us, uh, especially at 8 in the morning. So it's never too early for cannabis policy discussion. And I would like to uh, share with you a few um, tips on the cannabis clubs uh, phenomenon in, in Spain. So I will provide a bit of an overview of, of cannabis uh, use and, and cannabis policy opinions in Spain. And, and some legal and policy context, so we can have more like the, the, the basis of, of this model. And also I will provide with some data uh, from a study we, we published last year from, from ICRs. Um, well, cannabis, uh, Spain is one of the most, um, the, the, well, with the highest, is one of the countries with the highest prevalence of cannabis use, so we have, uh, during the, la the past decade, mm -hmm. it's been between nine and eleven percent the annual prevalence. So we have, and we have um, like more than half a million people using cannabis, cannabis every day. We we also well estimations suggest that we have uh, one hundred um, twenty thousand people um, making um, using cannabis for therapeutic uh, reason reasons. And most of these people uh, are supposed to supply from uh, cannabis clubs and from self-cultivation. Um, so we can also uh, see that the perception of the support for regulation, both for medical cannabis and for recreational um, cannabis markets is high, is considerably high in Spain. But despite all this, like uh, normalization of use, like considerable uh, prevalence rates, we we still don't have uh, a medical cannabis program or recreational market regulation. So um, this is uh, well the context in, in which uh, the model of the cannabis clubs um, uh, flourished and, and consolidated and. Um, for you that are not familiarized with the with this phenomenon, this uh, the cannabis, the term cannabis social clubs, uh, in fact, cover different realities in on the ground. But uh, we can say they are legally constituted registered nonprofit association of of previous adult cannabis users that collectively cultivate cannabis uh, to meet their personal needs. So this is uh, it's. It's a phenomenon in which users organize themselves to uh, to um, manage the complete cycle of, 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 of production and distribution of cannabis without resorting to the underground market. Some uh, uh, some data of, of more tips on, on cannabis clubs in Spain. They are uh, this is a phenomenon very uh, focused in on Catalonia and the Basque Country. So it's estimated that we <coughs> we have uh, uh, between 800 and 1,000 clubs in in the country. So uh, 
for example, in the city of Barcelona, we we are, it's very likely that we have between 250 and 300 uh, clubs. And this is, uh, it's important to recall uh, that this is not a, like a, a, a result of a public policy. It's, a, it's an alternative conceived by civil society. So it's, um, it's um, cannabis users that decided to organize themselves to find spaces to cultivate and to distribute cannabis among small groups of them without uh, uh, restraint to the black market so they can, um, they can uh, avoid like punitive drug policies. So this is a phenomenon, it's not exclusive of Spain. We also have cannabis clubs in Belgium, in the UK, in Uruguay, etc. But this is a model that has, uh, the model in Spain has been um, looked uh, from, from different places, especially in those countries and those territories where, where cannabis has been regulated. And also, well, our estimation suggests that between six and 12 of, of, of cannabis clubs members are, are well, use cannabis for, for medical or therapeutic reasons. So the context that made this or makes this, um, this phenomenon um, possible, let's say, it's, uh, well, there are several, several legal, I don't, I'm not sure if we could call it legal loopholes, but it's the law and the policy we, we have been uh, um, experiencing in, in Spain is that we, we, well, drug use, possession and cultivation for personal use is not criminalized in, in Spain. But however, we have like very harsh administrative sanctions, so that's why we call it like a decrim light. So we we have uh, decriminalization factor, but but the administrative sanctions are, are really uh, really really strong. Also, in the in the eighties, during the well, we had a, a an important peak of of heroin. Um, use and, and, and social implications, like very strong social implications uh, related to heroin use in, in the 80s. So the, the Supreme Court decided to, to develop and apply this, this uh, doctrine co called the share consumption doctrine. That means that no criminal offense uh, um, is, uh, is um, applied if the, the, the sale of the interchange of the, of the substance is made in a closed, concrete group, and there's no profit from distribution, and there is an immediate consumption. So these are all these, um, these um, conditions, let's say, to, to share consumption doctrine to be applied has been like the guide for social cannabis clubs to uh, define their roles. Also, uh, it's very important that they are like legally established associations, so the they are based in the in the in the law regulating the right of association. So they are registers. They are uh, uh, they have their statutes. They have their board, and and due to the circumsumption doctrines, the activities that clubs perform cannot be considered or have not been considered uh, a crime. So the the activity of the clubs has um, deal with different uh, administrations in in the Spanish <coughs> policy system. So uh, we have been like a central government and the attorney general and, and the Supreme Court uh, from 2015 that shifted this, uh, this position regarding clubs. And, and so the central government, especially with the previous administration, we have to see what happened now with the new government, has been like belligerent against clubs, so not that tolerant. But the regional parliaments and the, municipal, the municipalities has tried to introduce uh, mm, uh, laws uh, regulating the activities of these clubs, since these administrations did deal more with daily life of, of, of the associations. So we, we had three laws, three regional laws uh, passed in, in Navarra, Catalonia, and Basque Country. And Navarra and Catalonia were declared null and, and void by the Constitutional Court. So they are not, they won't be applied. And also, it's very interesting that at the municipal level, we, we have in more than 20 cities, more, most of them are in Catalonia, we have uh, bylaws regulating the, the premises of the clubs, so the, the hours of operation, the cap capacity, safety, the relations with the community, etc. Now, to, to beyond the context, uh, to, to provide you with some like 
the the, mo the most recent data we, we have uh, collected in, in, in ISIS in relation to cannabis clubs is uh, I would like to, to give you a few results of this of, of this uh, article published last year which aims were to establish this socio demographic profile of cannabis uh, clubs members and also to 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 assess the impact of the, this membership over uh, the, the the patterns of, of use of this of these members so a few notes on methodology this um, this uh, research was conducted in 20 cannabis clubs in, in the city of Barcelona with a sample of 155 uh, members. And the, the data uh, w was collected in, in 2015. So all these clubs were, are part of federations of cannabis clubs. So they are, they are very likely somehow to have a, a, a bias because this, these clubs uh, participating in federations are supposed to be more involved in policy change and, and, and to have a more, a more like advocacy uh, um, aim. So uh, what's the average of, of the social profile of, of, of a member of a club is a man. It's in the beginning of uh, his 30s. He's a Spanish national, he's educated, he's middle income, and he has a stable employment and a stable emotional situations. Say that because emotional situations, because most of them live with their parents, which is very common in, the, in your thirties in Spain, by the way. And, and also they have formal couples and, and they have a formal employ, employment. So uh, that's to, to see that it's maybe not like the, the image we, we, we sometimes see from, from the authorities about a, a cannabis user. So what's the relations, what we found about the, the relation of, of, um, of the membership with the, with the use of cannabis? Because that's another like concern of the authorities is when people join a cannabis club, then you increase your, your use. But we, what we found is that only 4% of the, of the respondents uh, uh, reported to have incre having increased his, uh, their, their, their use. Most of them, like consume the, the same amount, like 47%. Um, um, and the, the other bigger uh, group said like they have stopped and started using cannabis uh, several times. So we, we see that they, it's not necessary that the joining a club ma makes you uh, use more. Where uh, another interesting finding, and I'm sharing with you the findings more related to public policy, let's say, and not that that uh, have more like more policy implications, let's say, is that uh, when joining a, when, when people people join a, a cannabis clubs, they, they tend to to use more in in private places and, and in the premises of, of the clubs. So the the use in, in public spaces decreases, and that means that also after joining a, a, a cannabis clubs, you, you you get less fines for use in public space, obviously. And also I'm very important and related to, to Susanna's uh, presentation is that uh, one thing that the members of the clubs uh, value very, very much is the, is the, the services, the, the risk reduction services and the information services that, that are provided within the premises of, of the clubs. So many of them um, consider that, that join, when, when join, when the, 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 when they join the clubs, they, they are reducing the risk associated with, with cannabis use and, and they have increased uh, their like kind of, or they have started up healthier uh, use of, of cannabis. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I would like to, to share with you some ideas about the potential of this model because I see this, uh, we can see this potential for cannabis users, for communities, for uh, public institutions and for the society in general. So one interesting thing is that uh, for cannabis users is that when, when it comes to, to cannabis social clubs and the potential, they, they, they take this leadership role. So they, they can uh, be active agents in, in, in <clears throat> generating informal social norms and peer training. This is very clear in the case of therapeutic users that clubs has has welcomed these these users and therapeutic users found a place where, where they can 
be uh, informed and and, <clears throat> and and directed to refer to to doctors. Also, uh, the, the the club provide a, a, a private space for 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 use and, and, and information on quality and a stable supply, which is in fact very important for therapeutic users. Also for the community, they have uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the most important thing is that, or one of the most important things is that the, the, the clubs um, is, is an agent of, 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 uh, of separation of drug markets. So you, 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 you have uh, cannabis in the club, but you can find other, other substances and, and also, the, 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 when, when there's a club in a, in a community, you, the, the use in public space uh, 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 decreases, so it means also like an optimization of, of resources for, for um, law enforcement uh, authorities. Um, for public institutions, or also cannabis clubs are like privileged uh, 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 spaces for, for for implementation of, of risk reduction program and, and identifying kind of um, problematic uh, use and 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 also they are they could be they can be conceived as a spaces for the creation of, of, of culture for socialization um, and also to f for like a, a reference for the public health system to regarding therapeutic use and finally for society uh, there are. They also can be conceived as a, as a, as a important agents for so civil society participation and, and policy experimentation, especially in the context of, of, of the economic crisis that we we suffer the last decade. Well, they were also a source of, of, of employment, tax collection, and 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 also reduction of, of public expenditure. Um, just to end. Uh, I would like to pose you this question. So if all this happened be, despite the lack of regulation, well, can you imagine if all this informal social norm was translated into formal, evidence-based, and accountable public policy? So that's something that yeah. we can discuss later. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming at this early hour. <laughs> but uh, we have a full uh, room, so that's nice. Um, I will talk a little bit about the local level in, in, uh, in Europe, what's happening in, in Europe. Um, a kind of, maybe you could say, attempts to self-regulation of cannabis uh, by municipalities. Um, Maybe some, something first, how does that work? Maybe I'll put off my glasses. Yeah, okay. um, something about the project, this was uh, uh, funded by the European Union and the Open Society Foundations. Um, we did uh, research in six um, uh, countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Switzerland, Denmark and Belgium. Um, at the time, these were uh, the countries, and I'm talking now about 2016, more or less, that um, had some uh, um, attempts to uh, self-regulate from, from different perspectives. So uh, we, uh, we had uh, six academic researchers uh, looking at the situations in these uh, countries. Uh, they produced some country reports, um, more detailing on... on uh, um, uh, each country and then we had an interactive seminar where we brought together those academics people from the municipalities from those countries and uh, um, a more um, let's say um, activist uh, uh, people um, it all resulted in a final report which you can find on the table here and in a somewhat uh, shorter briefing which is like a summary of that final report because the final report is about 60 pages or so, so we thought, no. Uh, and you can all find all these uh, publications on our website um, over there. So, um, because we didn't print out the, um, the, the country report, so you can find, find them over there. Uh, I will go through the key points because it's a very, 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 very um, rich um, 
report that uh, you go into the history of, of, of many countries. Uh, and uh, the, one of the, the things we were looking at is that while, while you see that more and more countries are uh, exploring uh, cannabis, uh, new cannabis policies, regulation of, of recreational cannabis in, in particular, you could see at the national level in Europe uh, there's a deadlock. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of talk, but little is happening uh, un until, uh, well, we had that... Uh, interactive seminar in November 2018 and then the next month uh, Luxembourg as the first European country announced that they would uh, that, uh, regulate uh, cannabis so maybe there is a, a, a different um, uh, track now but maybe in in, in, um, in Europe but yeah you also have to stand that understand that Luxembourg although it's a, it's a independent sovereign country uh, it's about half of Amsterdam in, in uh, terms of population. Um, there are of course different kinds of already existing cannabis markets in these six countries. The most uh, well known is of course the Netherlands with its uh, coffee shops where there are about now uh, I would say 500 and 80 uh, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and that has, of course, a, a long history. Uh, we just heard from Spain, from Constanza, uh, how that developed. There are a thousand, um, maybe, nobody really knows how many there are. Um, and other countries uh, do not really have such a, a already existing system. Uh, next. Uh, What is under important to understand is that um, although there are attempts at, at municipal level, they're of course very limited by their uh, official powers. Uh, I mean, the um, national law is still dominant on these kinds of issues because it's criminal law, and, and those national laws are then of course, also very determined by the UN <coughs> Convention. So the room for maneuver for these municipalities is not uh, not not very uh, wide uh, but still there are, are, are things are going on some people say well all drug policy in the end is local but that's where it has to be implemented and also that's where um, the municipalities or the, the city governments yeah they have to deal with the situation on the ground uh, they have to they are confronted with street dealing and disorder and with street dealing or with illegal cultivation in, in, in residential areas, for instance. So th these are municipalities have to deal with these kinds of, of things. And so you can see a, yeah, a diverging from what, what is the general framework, uh, international and national, to, yeah, just imagine the, the local alderman trying to, to keep his city uh, uh, running. Um, next. Uh, I don't want to get that. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe next. <laughs> uh, there's also a long history, of course. Um, you can see uh, that since the late six, 1960s, more and more countries, first the Netherlands, but more <coughs> and more, have been uh, following uh, that trend, uh, uh, yeah. developing a kind of leniency towards the, the stricter norms uh, set up uh, or det determined by the conventions and national laws. And you see some kind of um, distinction trying to separate the market. The Netherlands was, of course, first at that between the, the, the cannabis market and the more uh, uh, market with more uh, uh, dangerous drugs, uh, such as heroin, especially at that time. Um, so you could see in, in each of these six countries there was already a, a <coughs> a kind of soft defection going on from that uh, uh, prohibitionist uh, model. Uh, and you could see that developed, uh, if you look, for instance, at the coffee shop system in the Netherlands, that was not, never something that the government had thought out, but that was actually really something that developed uh, slowly with ups and downs, uh, bottom up, uh, by uh, people who just started a coffee shop or uh, and then um, started to 
implement their own rules. It's a little bit like what uh, Susanna was telling about uh, uh, per uh, persons. You could also see a kind of self-regulation model uh, uh, developing with, within the coffee shops, uh, which then later became uh, 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 rules from the municipalities and then later even became national guidelines by the prosecution office. So it's, it's a very bottom-up model, and you can see the same in Spain. Uh, people just tired of, of, of being confronted with the black market start to, to organize themselves, um, set up these clubs, and then, yeah, they, they are there, and then the mu municipality has to deal with what are we going to do with this. It's a very bottom-up uh, model of, of uh, how people try to... Uh, self-regulate the market, let's put it that way, not their use, but where they have to buy. So they, they're sick and tired of, 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 uh, of uh, going uh, um, to shady dealers and, and the risk of uh, with that and not knowing what kind of cannabis you can you are buying to these kinds of um, yeah, self-regulated uh, models, which then get a kind of legi legitimacy by the municipalities. Next. Uh, yeah, <coughs> but you, one, o one of the things you could see is a little bit different of what you see, uh, what, what uh, Constanza explained in, in, uh, in Spain, is that the subnational authorities, the municipalities, but also sometimes um, regions, because yeah, uh, Europe is a very diverse continent with different kind of uh, states. You have the federal state in, in Germany, where the, the provinces or the lender, as they are called, have more autonomy than, uh, than, for instance, provinces in, in, in the Netherlands or in, in, in Belgium. Um, so what you could see more in the northern countries, uh, like um, the Nen uh, um, yeah, Denmark, um, two or five? Five. <laughs> five, okay. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> they, um, like uh, Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, several cities in uh, in Germany, and notably uh, a district in uh, in, in uh, Berlin that started with it, uh, Kreuzberg uh, Predesign, um, trying to do this in in, in 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 yeah, trying to get some kind of of, of uh, permission from the from the national government, and that was to setting up pilot projects and then ask. Uh, permission from uh, the national government to, to uh, uh, do this. Uh, actually, that only has been now um, successful in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, in, in, in Germany, there is no, uh, at, at the moment, uh, no pilot pr project going on, despite several cities uh, uh, trying to get that, uh, that, that permission. In Switzerland, we're now at this, uh, th that was also refused by, by the government uh, office, but they now changed the law to, um, yeah, to allow for these kinds of pilot projects, and we will see that will develop in the, in the, in the, in the coming years. Um, yeah, maybe next. What we came up with is, is what you can see, th these are two, uh, concepts we're trying to develop. Um, one is already yeah, the, the multi-level governance is, is, is that, and it's actually both are a kind of decentralization model where um, national governments, and that is already a trend in Europe, um, give more and more tasks and, uh, to uh, the more local level, to the mu municipalities or regions to uh, implement uh, policies. Um, and we came up uh, with what I think is the most interesting model is, is that of local customization. Uh, <coughs> we borrowed that again from uh, what's happening in the Netherlands to, to give you an idea. Uh, uh, in the Netherlands, yes, coffee shops are allowed, but it's up to the municipalities to decide if they want to have one. So, And that's only in, in about 25% of the municipalities in the Netherlands have a coffee shop. So it's up to the city to, to, to decide whether or not they want to do that. Uh, and the city can also uh, add some additional rules to the national guidelines that are there. For instance, there are some cities that don't allow uh, commercial coffee shops, but only non-profit coffee shops. 
Um, and so it, it, the, the point is that you then can have a very tailor-made uh, set of uh, regulations and, and agreements um, to, um, to regulate your local uh, uh, cannabis uh, market. Uh, uh, we think that is an interesting concept. Of course, there needs to be national legislations that allows that. And of course, for that, you also need to start thinking at uh, what uh, is allowed under the UN conventions. That would all not be allowed under the convention. So you have to find at these different levels ways of, of uh, reforming uh, those laws and, and treaties. Uh, but we think it's, it's uh, something that maybe is, is uh, the most uh, appropriate way of doing it. And if you look, for instance, at the United States, Colorado, and Washington, uh, something similar exists. Okay, at that level, uh, cannabis is regulated and is allowed, but you see that a lot of cities in the, or counties, as they're called, in, in, in those states opt out of that uh, uh, regulation mo model because they don't want it. And um, so we think that is a good way of, yeah, let, keep it at, at, at the local level, um, let the citizens there in the cities decide what they want, uh, but uh, create a space for cities to do so and, and regulate their market. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Really few minutes for some question, uh, observation, comment, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> so. Uh, hello, uh, local staff, fields of green for all uh, South Africa. Um, so our constitutional court ruled in September 2018 that the private use, cultivation, and possession of cannabis um, should become legal. Uh, the government were given two years to change the law, and that co comes up now in September 2020. So in the interim, we have, uh, we estimate between 40 and 50 Dacha private clubs. That's what we call them, because Dacha is our word. So I've got two questions. The first one is for Coach um, uh, About the federation, would you um, advise that as a country or as different provinces, that we set up a private clubs federation as an oversight body. Uh, is this advisable to have something that all the clubs can belong to a federation? Mm -hmm. uh, that's my first question. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, um, what does one do about the uh, course threat from commercialization? Because just last week we had a workshop with all the private clubs in our area in Johannesburg and the one man stood up and he said, come, join my clubs. I will come and help you uh, um, open a club. And so it would become something like a franchise. Yeah. Now mm -hmm. my instinct for that is no. Each club must be a separate uh, non-profit entity. Okay, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean to say that we can't all get salaries and everything. Mm -hmm. And But I didn't have the right answer to this man because now we will have like Bulldog Coffee Shop in Amsterdam where there's 10 Bulldog Coffee Shops. And mm -hmm. uh, what would you advise for this situation? Because we, have, we haven't got new laws in South Africa yet and we have this big pull between commercialization and clubs and we want mm -hmm. to preserve our clubs for our culture because the, the clubs have the potential to serve the poor mm. because you can have a club in an informal settlement and you can have a club for traditional healers. Mm. So we feel very strongly about that and what to do about the threat of people who want to franchise. Mm. So we can collect a couple of questions and then answer. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I've got a question. What do you think would happen if uh, some country just said Bye-bye uh, conventions. We don't think it's in our national interest. And we're going to do what we want to do. Yeah. Um, the last one, because yeah, we have to leave the room. I just want to point out quickly that um, just there is an initiative in line with uh, some of the things that have been said uh, in, uh, in this side event. Um, we, together with the, the Associazione um, Luca Coscioni and other potential partners, we are uh, thinking about uh, launching uh, an ECI, European Citizen 
initiative uh, on the removal of cannabis from the Council Framework decision of October uh, 2004, um, which lays down minimum provision on uh, uh, the constituent element of criminal act and penalty in the field of illicit drug trafficking. So the removal of cannabis from this yeah, yeah, framework decision uh, would allow member states to have uh, more uh, liberty to decide their cannabis policies. And so as uh, Costanza was pointing out, the, the bottom-up uh, push is always uh, uh, fundamental in, uh, in cannabis uh, regulation and uh, it can be, uh, it can change a lot uh, in the legislation and so uh, we, we know that this thing will not uh, solve the, the problem in itself because we should address to the international laws but it would be a strong signal to start from the EU level to have a huge cannabis reform. Thank you, there is another, and, uh, so but sorry, last thing very short, that, please, yeah, yeah, because yeah, we have to... That we're going to meet with other organizations in, okay. uh, in, uh, in a quarter post nine in MO27. Uh, if you want to, you're interested in this topic, uh, we will discuss it. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, thank shortly. You. My name is Talib yes. I just would like to have uh, two things and one question. The first thing is that uh, ANCON, the uh, European Energy Coalition of Protests and Effective Drug Policies, has issued in 2005, a code of conduct that gives some minimum <coughs> rules for those who would like to set up a cannabis social club. My question is more about uh, your research, uh, Constanza and uh, Dr. Russo. Do you think that we want to control, we want to advocate a cannabis social club as a solution to have a better control on the market? It will be very provocative, but we also need to have some epidemiological or clinical uh, result from uh, cannabis use. Do you think that cannabis social club could be also a tool for authorities to establish experimentation in a way to have to collect as much as possible epidemiological uh, data about the consumers? Okay, uh, Joanna, and then just a couple of minutes to, to give an answer, sorry, because we have... My, my question is very simple. If you have an idea how to decentralize the access to cannabis clubs for those that cannot arrive to cannabis clubs, for those people that still need cannabis but have no like social and economic uh, possessions for go to a club and buy uh, weed for mm. Online, online sales. <laughs> so, co so uh, Costanza and Tom, very shortly, yeah. if you can give it. Well, your, your question is, is, has a long answer, <laughs> but um, I, um, I, I will, what we have in, in, in Spain is a very complex uh, of, of organization of, of cannabis clubs, really, because we have regional federations, then we have uh, a national uh, federation, and also in Catalonia we have two different federations representing <coughs> two styles of cannabis clubs, like more commercial, more members, etc., and like the one more activist, the smaller, etc. The experience in, 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 in Spain, I think, I would recommend to explore that option because it's, it's very, it, it provides you with, as, um, with a tool to, to interact with the authorities. Also, you, ha you, can, you can allocate like um, energies and have like legal uh, advi ad legal um, advice or different like uh, code of conduct uh, etc and, and you can articulate like a more interesting proposal but also uh, our experience in Spain is that the it's very difficult to economically uh, uh, survive with a very small club, especially in a city like Barcelona, where you, when you have to pay uh, like a very, very high rent for your space. So that's really difficult, even if, if people, like many people would like to have like a small thing of 100 people, etc. That's that's really difficult for surviving. And and so that's why bigger clubs or, or, or small try well, ended up being like, bigger. Also, um, what we have seen in Spain is that the most you, 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 you advocate for clubs, the, mo the most exposed you are to the authorities. And now we have the two, the two leaders of, of, uh, of the Catalan's federations. They are pending in jail, so they can go to jail in, in, 
any moment. So, and the same happened with Martin Barrioso at some point mm. in the past. Sorry, Costanza, we have to yeah. leave the, the room to other people. Yeah. Okay, so Tom, two words. Yeah. You yeah, can, you, yeah. We can no. continue informally to discuss. No, uh, no, but, uh, sorry, only, only to, sorry, two, two words by Tom. Yeah. On the issue of bye-bye of, uh, uh, conventions, uh, that sounds very attractive, of course, but uh, the conventions are part of a body of a larger body of international law. But, but would you think of countries saying bye-bye to the human rights conventions or bye-bye to the nu anti-nuclear uh, prolifer proliferation convention? So, yeah, I, I, I think international law is already a fragile building and we should not start getting, uh, okay. destroying it even more. Yeah. Thank you to all of you.